Well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me today. It's really a real privilege to be here, especially coming all the way from Oxford. So what I'm going to uh, show you briefly today is actually a very pragmatical uh, view on our own experience with one such big data set in neuroimaging and how we extracted the inform information that was biologically meaningful and hopefully translatable further down the line as well. So, a bit of context, I belong to the Oxford University FEMRIP Center, that's how we pronounce it, don't ask me why. It was founded more than 15 years ago and comprises two MRI scanners, uh, one 7 Tesla scanner, which is one of only two in the UK, and a 3T Prisma scanner, which was installed only a few weeks ago. It's organized according to three themes, and importantly, my group belongs to both the basic and clinical neuroscience theme, but also importantly to the analysis group, which some of you who deal with neuroimaging might know for being responsible for the FSL software, or FOSSIL, which is why you've got a FOSSIL at the back of it, uh, which is used in more uh, than 5,000 labs and by more than 40,000 users. So what are the uh, big data ongoing projects that the FEMRIB is deeply involved with? Well, first of all, uh, some of you must have heard of the Human Connectome Project, which is this uh, vast NIH project led by the WashU Human Oxford Consortium, which looks at uh, mapping the brain circuitry in more than 1,200 healthy young adults using cutting-edge uh, cutting methods for non-invasive neuroimaging, so using MRI scans. Then we also have the developing uh, HCP, uh, which is this time a European-funded endeavor, which looks at doing exactly the same thing in 1,000 babies. And finally, as Martin just introduced you to, there's this fantastic endeavor of the UK Biobank, which is this epidemiological study looking at bringing back 100,000 participants for multimodal brain and cardiac MRI. So I could tell you all about the heartaches of study design and about the blood, sweat, and tears put into these acquisition protocols, about the sharing of the data between the groups, uh, be um, about the releasing of the data, because, uh, for instance, the HCP is releasing constantly uh, the data set. But for the next nine minutes of uh, this talk, I'm actually going to focus on what you can do once you've got such a big data set. And that's a collaboration we've got uh, between FEMRIB and uh, an Oslo uh, group, uh, for which they had images of brain structure, so looking at the gramata, in uh, nearly 500 healthy subjects, which covered most of the lifespan. So this kind of data set, as Martin mentioned, they comes with a lot of data points, a lot of demographics, but this is not necessarily information. So how do you go about uh, analyzing such a data set? It can be quite daunting and not knowing necessarily which angle you will adopt to analyze it. So in that case, what we decided to do was to let the data speak for itself. And so we used a data-driven approach, a uh, so-called FSL-linked ICA, or called FLICA. And so the basically boil down the data from uh, 500 healthy subjects to 70 what we call independent components. And all you need to know is that these 70 components are describing the modes of variation of the brain structure across all the subjects. So again, we took these 500 healthy subjects MRI scans and moved to 70 modes of variation of that brain structure across the subjects. But that method is only um, based, basically, on the information in the MRI scans. It doesn't know anything about the age of the subjects, the gender of the subjects, any socioeconomic status. So the next question we asked was whether some of these components were related to age. And indeed, we identified two very strong such components. The very first one, for those of you who are familiar with neuroscience, is describing pretty much the whole brain, um, explains most of the structural variants across all the subjects, and describes this nonlinear monotonic loss of grammar over time that is typically described in um, large-scale lifespan studies. 
But importantly, because of that method that we had, we were able to single out another component, which explained a more, if you want, more subtle part of the structural variance, but that also defined a very specific network of gramata regions, which we call the cross-modal or transmodal regions, which are these higher order regions, which, if you want, combine uh, or integrate information coming from different senses. And these specific grammar network of brain regions show this striking inverted U-shaped pattern with age, which meant that in these specific regions, the development mirrored actually the aging, healthy aging, again, processes. So the next question we wanted to ask was whether, um, well, actually, sorry, should go back to this. So if you put these two things together, uh, you have this strong effect of losing a grammar over time, that's 50% of the structural variance, for these specific grammar regions as part of the whole brain. And you also have on top of it this subtle quadratic effect. And so that means that altogether, if you look into these brain regions, they do develop later. Um, there's a protracted, if you want, maturational process during adolescence and young adulthood, as you can see here, with a less steep slope compared to the rest of the brain. But also in the very same regions, you have a susceptibility, if you want, vulnerability to healthy age-related degeneration, as shown here with a steeper slope compared to the rest of the brain. So the next question we wanted to ask was whether um, if diseases impact are known to impact onto the brain structure precisely during adolescence and young adulthood or uh, in older age, would they preferentially target this specific network of grammar regions as being the one ongoing the most changes? That's exactly what we found. Uh, first, we took adolescent onset schizophrenia as, if you want, a model of altered developmental trajectory uh, for brain structure uh, during adolescence, and we found a very good spatial correspondence uh, with our network here in orange, the adolescent onset schizophrenia, if structural damage being in green. But on the other hand, we also found a very good spatial correspondence with Alzheimer's disease, which can be seen as a big oversimplification as an unhealthy uh, aging process here in blue. And most challenging of all is that we had a very good correspondence, spatial correspondence, between adolescent onset schizophrenia structural damage and Alzheimer's disease damage. So we went one step further and wanted to ask whether uh, this brain network, this healthy brain network, in these 500 healthy participants was associated with measures um, whose impair impairment are very well known to be key features in both schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. That's again what we found with a very neat linear relationship with intellectual, intellectual ability, which is uh, quite impaired in uh, schizophrenia, but also with long-term memory, which, as most of you know, is, is very a very salient measure in Alzheimer's disease. And if you see this linear relationship, you might be able to infer that there's these measures actually follow the same lifespan trajectory, inverted U-shape trajectory across age, probably underlined by that very specific grammar network. So I hope I was able to convince you here that one way to extract information coming from these kind of daunting big data set is to let the data talk for itself. But uh, this is no panacea, I'm not going to lie to you. It is still uh, time-consuming and user-dependent to identify relevant information and interpret that information. And here, if I've got maybe one minute uh, for a word of caution about this big data set. Here I'm showing you all the components that showed actually a very strong, significant effect with age. And the top two are the ones I've discussed in this talk. But you can see maybe, if I zoom into another one, why it was not uh, considered further. You can see that their uh, quadratic fit uh, over age is wholly unconvincing. Unfortunately, it still comes with a very convincing p-value. That really speaks to the fact 
that for such big data sets with number of uh, data points, you really need something that neuroimaging statisticians advocate quite vocally for, actually, which is a need for practical significance. So looking at FX size, such as, for instance, here, the percentage of the variance explained or uh, the coefficient of the quadratic fit, for instance, in addition to statistical significance. So, if you use such a data-driven approach, what do you get? Well, you get here, uh, from these 500 healthy subjects, a biologically meaningful network of grammar regions in which healthy development and aging mirrors one another, uh, and which reproduces, interestingly, despite being driven from healthy subjects, reproduces structural abnormalities of two disorders that are at completely opposite ends of the life spectrum, adolescent onset schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. And that is also, as we've seen, associated with key symptoms of both disorders, intellectual ability and long-term memory, but also other measures. So altogether, uh, what we propose here is that the structural abnormalities common to these disorders might be partly determined by when, by the timing of when they're distinct, because they are distinct, pathological processes interact with normal, healthy brain development and aging. And in turn, this might speak to the fact that we might be able to find common preventive strategies for both disorders that target, in the healthy brain, this weak spot. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, my FEMIP colleagues, particularly Professor Steve Smith, who's the head of the analysis group and the master of FSL, uh, statistician uh, Professor Tom Nichols, Professor Eugene Duff, Adrian Groves, and Professor Heidi Johnsonberg, my funders, uh, and as well, my collaborators in Oslo, Basel, London, and Oxford. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>